Hello, everyone. All right. Unlike everyone else, I didn't prepare a talk. But I'm a professor, so I talk a lot. So it's, we're all in good hands. So a few weeks back, I got an email from this guy, Josh Manning. He said, hey, Hakeem, you know, we're having this uh, Innovation Expo at NASA. You know, you've invented some things. We'd like you to come and give a talk. And I thought to myself, wow, the author of this email must have one crazy beard, right? And uh, <laughs> I get here today, and turns out I was right, yeah. So um, there's been a lot of talk about uh, a lot of things, you know, and uh, today. And there's a theme that keeps coming up, and that's about believing in your ideas and the, ex you know, the experience, what you get from other people. And there's yes, but brother versus yes, and. And it reminds me a lot of what happens um, when I go out and talk around the country, around the world, about cosmology, right? So cosmology is kind of controversial. You know, the Big Bang Theory, you know, it's kind of, um, is people feel like it's in conflict with religious beliefs all the time and this sort of thing. And so, you know, there's a lot of topics like that in science, like evolution and global warming. And so I get the idea that people have this notion that scientists have this meeting every 20, 30 years, that we all get in a room and we're like, what's the big lie we're all going to agree on, right? <laughs> but the truth is something very different from that, right? You, you work hard on something for years, you put all your, your, your effort in it, you make sure you got everything right, and you present it to your colleagues, and what do they say? <laughs> Get out of here, I don't believe it, right? There's a great, um, I love the history of science, right? There's a great story from the history of science. Have you, anybody heard of Srinivasan Chandrasekhar, the Nobel Prize winner? Okay, well, <laughs> he was a young dude uh, in India, and so, um, he was trying to figure out what happens to stars when they die, right? And he found that a star like the sun, a small mass star, would collapse under its own gravity until it was about the size of the Earth, all right? And that um, these stars had this crazy property. We call them white dwarfs. When it comes to objects that are, you know, planets, stars, the more massive they get, the larger they get, right? But these white dwarfs, the more massive they were, the smaller they'd become because they were just getting more and more crunched down by gravity. And then he found that at 1.44 solar masses, if it got more massive than that, the laws of physics couldn't describe what would happen. Something crazy would happen, but he had no idea what it was. We now know that it would form a neutron star, but at the time the neutron had not yet been invented, right, or discovered. Um, and so what he does is he's about to go to this big meeting, at this conference, and so he wants to present this idea at this conference. And so he sends his work to Sir Arthur Eddington, who was the Astronomer Royal in England. And he says, Sir Arthur Eddington, can you please tell me, you know, have I done everything right? Is there anything wrong with this? And Arthur Eddington tells him, no, there's nothing wrong with it. Go ahead, give the talk. And then Arthur Eddington contacts the conference organizers and says, make sure I speak immediately following Srinivas and Chandrasekhar. And Chandrasekhar gets up there and presents his work, and Arthur Eddington gives, gets up there and right behind him tells the conference why everything Srinivasan just said is not true. And nothing special happens at 1.44 solar masses, right? Now it turns out that Srinivasan Chandrasekhar was right. And 30 years later, he won the Nobel Prize in physics, right? For that work in large part. But that's kind of the experience I've had as a, um, as a scientist. So I have several patents, right? One example is I was in Silicon Valley. And I uh, was my first day on the job, and we were making, we make, I work for a company called Applied Materials. It sort of dominates the market in making the tools that make chips, okay? And so when you make computer chips, you have to figure out how well did the last process step take place? How well did it go? So if you're depositing a layer of material, you know, was it uniform? Is it the right thickness? Um, and sometimes you remove material in etching. And so the question is, is, you know, what was the standard way of doing things is you put in these test wafers, right? You put in these wafers that you go in there, you're never going to use them, you just deposit the layer, and after the process step, you check it to see if it worked properly. And that costs money, right? And that costs resources. So is there a way to do it, to do this process, where we don't waste these resources? So this scientist had come up with this idea, right? Moshe Sarfati. His idea was, well, a lot of these processes use plasmas, and plasmas emit light. So maybe we can observe that emission and tell what's happening in the chamber in real time. But the problem is, is that if you're depositing, how do you look in this chamber? 
right? There's a little window, you apply a fiber optic, and you capture the light that way. But if you're removing stuff, the stuff that you remove will deposit on the window. If you're depositing stuff, the stuff, the stuff that you deposit will deposit on the window. So can you believe what's coming out, right? So I get there the first day, and the three managers are talking about this, and I say, hey, well, you know, in astrophysics, in order to deal with this same problem, we do these ratios, you know, so even though uh, something may change the signal, the signal may go up and down, the ratios of things would generally remain the same. And they all look at each other. They go, nah, right? And so I started working for Safati. He was my manager, right? He was my direct manager. And he said, Hakeem, here's what I want you to do. Boop. And I said, well, you know, Moshe, I think this idea of ratios will really work. And he goes, look, man, I told you, you know, it's not going to work. You know, there are so many different materials. You're going to get absorption. And I said, no, I think the main process is going to be scattering. It's like, is it too technical? You guys are technical people, right? Yeah. Where are my nerds at? <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So we're down. All right. So what happened is, you know, I've never, you know, the reason why I left Silicon Valley, um, I was at a company, and I don't know, NASA might work like a company, but they got these crazy rules in companies. They want you to show up. In the morning, right? <laughs> Stay all day, right? I've never been into that. So, uh, you know, so I went and I did it anyway, all right? I went and I did it anyway. I went and I developed this idea and um, I presented it and it worked, right? It's like, have you ever heard the admonishment given to writers, right? If you're going to write characters, show, don't tell. Yeah, don't, don't, you know, this is going to work, right? Yeah, whatever, right? But when you make it happen, so what ended up happening is that it was really successful. It resulted in an entire new business group for the company, right? Several patents, myself and Moshe. And I tell you, when I first did it, Moshe, you know, we had to get a, get a rating, a rank, you know, a employee evaluation type rating, right? It was one, two, three, four, five. Three meets requirements, four meets some requirements, five does not meet, two is exceeds, one is, right, far exceeds. After that project, Moshe gave me a four, right? I'm like, what? And so I took him out to the, to the parking lot. Hey, let's go out to the parking lot. Let's argue, right? And Moshe started arguing when he compared me with the guy before me, right? He's like, this guy, he, you know, he came in every day. He had a tight communication loop. And, and I was like, Moshe, you're confusing activities with results, right? So he changed it to a two. And I'm like, I already deserve a one, right? But, <laughs> but you know, it turned out to be successful. Let me give you another example. So a big problem I find, by the way, what's my time? I, I didn't look at that either. What am I supposed to, what time am I supposed to be done? Oh, I got 10 minutes. Okay, yeah. So 12 minutes. Awesome. All right. So another thing that I find is that what really like impacts people greatly, like I'm from like rural Mississippi, you know, and I'm a scientist, I'm an astrophysicist, and, and I think I'm the only one, right? <laughs> and so uh, identity right, who you are, what you're doing, right? And so when I was a graduate student, I was doing astrophysics, and I was doing solar physics, right? You guys see these pretty pictures of the sun with all the plasma loops and all this? I was in a research group that did that for the first time. I, I was junior, it wasn't me, right? Um, but I got to like, you know, screw bolts in the rocket and all that sort of stuff. Um, lots of bolts. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I, I asked myself one day, I was like, who's, who's the greatest solar physicist who's ever lived? You guys know the answer? Right, right? So who am I going to be? Who is Hakeem Olushe going to be? People look back 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 years from now. Where am I going to be? You know, do me a favor. Name somebody that died in the year 1522. Right? Did he? No. <laughs> no, that wasn't right. Okay, and, and that's my point, right? So, so what am I going to do? And so for me, you know, I, I had my identity was, you know, I sort of had an outsider identity, right? You know, and so it was easy for me to like ignore my manager, like, eh, whatever, right? But it was hard for me to have belief in myself quite often. I was always the person, I came in from the small college in Mississippi, Tougaloo College. Uh, my graduate school was Stanford, right? No one else was from Tougaloo. Anybody heard of Tougaloo College? It's so elite, we don't even tell people it, it exists, <laughs> right? It's like ex exclusive, right? Um, but it was also about seven to one female to male, so that was, you like that? <laughs> um, 
But I had a hard time believing in myself. But I had a good friend who, who taught me an important lesson in life. And I'm going to use a bad word. So this is, you know, anybody who can't stand that, you might want to leave the room, right? So um, I wrote a paper, scientific paper, with my uh, graduate student colleague, a brilliant guy named David Santiago, right? And uh, we write this paper on some equations. <laughs> and we found these new solutions to these equations, right? So there's this book that was like the book, the Bible on this topic. It has to do with plasmas in the sun, right? And, um, and how they're heated. And so I'm, I, after we submit the paper, you know, and you care about your reputation, when you're a scientist, your reputation is everything. And so I'm going through this book, and I come up on a section on these equations, and there's this thing that says, yes, lots of people have looked for other solutions to these equations, but they don't exist. And we had just seen, submitted this paper. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm done, right? So I called David, David, look. I opened the book, right? David was Puerto Rican, right? So he spoke with an accent, so I'm going to impersonate him, right? <laughs> David reads it, and he goes, you see, man, even in the so-called Bibles, they write bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so when I ran up against Moshe and he said, and, and, and Dimitri Limberopoulos, and they were like, nah, it won't work, right? I knew from my good friend David that I needed to believe in myself because I knew what I knew at that point. And for me, you know, that's one of the greatest things. You guys are trying to innovate technology generally, but as a scientist, knowing the difference between what you know and don't know, right, is, is key. And it sounds really simple, but it really isn't. I've yet to say that to a person. Yeah, you know, it's important to know the difference between knowing and not knowing. And most people are like, oh, you got that right, right? And then they quickly illustrate that they don't quite know the difference, right? Um, so uh, the last thing I want to talk about is the conditions for, uh, for uh, innovation, right? So there's two things I want to mention. One thing is, is that, you know, when we talk about these things, we talk in idealized situations, right? The yes and, yes but is great. And, you know, when you're presenting ideas, you're brainstorming, you know, you can, you can utilize that, but you kind of get undermined in your daily activities, right? It's not the yes, but person, it's the well, actually guy, right? You know the well, actually guy? You know, you're talking, you know, you're just, ha you know, having water at the water fountain. You're like, yeah, pi equals 3.14. Well, actually, pi is 3.14, right? And you're constantly getting, you know, undercut and undermined in that, like, you know, it, it creates conditions in your mind that kind of make you want to hide or, 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 or something like that, right? And so I'll tell you the, the greatest thing, my last story um, that I find that's really awesome that has, it, for me, led to my discoveries, my patents, all, all these sort of things, and that's intimacy, right? Does anybody in here like to get intimate <laughs> with what you're working on? You got to... You gotta, you know, if you got to be into it. You know, somebody was talking about focus, right? You know, single-minded pursuit. You got to be into it. You got to be doing it. And so when I uh, did that thing with Moshe and those guys, I was really into spectroscopy at that point, right? I was all over it. I was into it. I wanted to understand it, get my mind around it. So then this problem showed up, and I already had the answer because I was intimate with it. So let me give you an example. I have a graduate student right now, this guy named Dave Chesney, David Chesney from Philadelphia. Dave, shout out. So that was into the camera. So we're studying, Dave's project is understanding how the sun accelerates and heats plasmas, right? So there are these two problems. If you look at the surface of the sun in the photosphere, it is about 6,000 degrees, right? The temperature above the sun surface, the corona, is about a million, right? So if I, you know, that's like, if this is 6,000 degrees, how could it be um, hotter here than it is there, right? It doesn't quite make sense. The other thing is that if you look at surface gravity at the surface of the sun, it's about 30 times stronger than gravity at the surface of Earth. Yet we know there's a solar wind, right? Yeah, the sun's atmosphere is blowing off into space. Why is it doing that? How are these um, plasmas being accelerated away, away from the sun? And so it's by the action of magnetic fields. And so what Dave is learning, you know, what we studied together is that, well, these particular magnetic field configurations give rise to this type of acceleration. And it turns out that the acceleration that the sun produces is faster than the exhaust of any rocket or propulsion mechanism that we have here on Earth, right? So Dave, I was like, Dave, man, you really need to be reading papers about this stuff, you know, more and more papers. And so Dave got into the experiments that people do to create plasmas in laboratories. And he discovered 
that we just crossed the threshold where we can actually create the plasma configurations that occur on the sun in these plasma chambers now. So half of Dave's PhD thesis, which he's completing, is a new propulsion te technology, right? An in-space propulsion technology that kicks the butt of everything that's out there, things like Vasemir, right? For example, a lot of people know about, right? But how did he know that? Because he was intimate with it, right? He was intimate with what the sun was doing. He got intimate with what people were doing in the laboratory. And so when the opportunity presented itself, right, when the day came, there it was. He had it. He put two and two together and, you know, necessity is the mother of invention and I don't have a saying for that. So I'm going to tell you one last story. This is a great story to end talks on. Did I get the two minute sign? Okay. The, the, the story is, was the kid who asked his dad, he was about to give a talk and he asked him, he said, hey, give me some advice for my talk. What do I need to do? And the dad said, it's really simple. If you want to be seen, stand up. If you want to be heard, speak up. And if you want to be appreciated, sit down and shut up. All right, thank you guys. <laughs> That's it. Questions? Any questions? Do I have time for questions? Oh. You can ask me anything. I'm a physicist. I know everything. Yeah. Uh. It, yeah, yeah, exactly. I'll tell you another st story. You want to hear another story? Yeah. All right, so I was in college as an undergraduate, right? Nobody in my family graduated college. My dad dropped out of school when he was nine. My mom dropped out of school when she was 16. So I'm in college, and I think I'm too dumb, you know, and I drop out, and I'm working as a janitor at the local hotel, right? The Ramada Renaissance in Jackson, Mississippi. And the, this is about adversity, by the way, right? And um, I was in housekeeping. And uh, the bellhop got fired, right? Now, the bellhop, you know, that guy gets tips. So you can make like 100 bucks in tips in a day. And so the year is like 1988. So the bellhop got fired. I had dropped out of college. I'm working as a janitor. And I apply for the bellhop position. And I don't get it. And I think to myself, I can't move up from janitor to bellhop? I'm going back to college, right? <laughs> so <laughs> thank you, Miss Jolly. So yeah. But you hear that a lot. You hear that from a lot of people, right? Your, your, your challenge, you know, something strikes you, and it, and it gives you that freedom, right? You have to set yourself free, right? Being comfortable just isn't necessarily going to do it. And, and, and you, know, you, you know, there's that story, like, if I only had a, you know, I want to live like I'm going to die tomorrow or something like that. You know that song? Yeah, yeah. And that's, a, that's that whole thing, right? Just having that freedom. Just be like, forget it, you know? Like, I remember, you know, me, I, one more story. Do I have time? Yeah, yeah. So I showed up. I'm right out of Mississippi. I show up to Stanford University Graduate School, right? I got this big, loud voice, you know? And you know how, like, in the beginning of class, this, before the professor starts, the students are chatting, you know? So there's, you know, the, the campus is wooded, and there's squirrels, raccoons all over the place. So I turn to this guy, and I go, hey, man, you see all these squirrels on campus? And he's like, yeah. And I go, how come nobody eats them, right? <laughs> yeah. And the whole class just stopped, and it's like, right? Yeah. So the point, though, is that, you know, my first years there were difficult because I was so different from everybody. You know, but no one could understand a word I said, and I thought I had to be something I wasn't. I, I thought I had to be like them, you know. And I did change the way I speak. I actually pronounce consonants now. But, <laughs> and I slowed down a lot. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and, and so there's a lot of these social pressures that just create this noise in your mind that don't free you to do the, the real creative stuff you can do on a given day. And then there's these people that may undermine you. So I came up with this two words phrase that ended with it that, <laughs> you know, kind of became like, oh, forget it. You know, I'm just going to do me, you know. And, you know, and the world will respect you for that. And the next thing you know, it's 100 years from now, right? So you better get on it. That's it. All right, that's it. All right, all right. <laughs> Thank you. All right.